Hello and welcome to this Psychiatry Consortium webinar. The session specifically around the current call for funding, which is now open, um, is due to close on the 8th of March. I'm Dr. Laura Ashram, the Programme Manager for the Psychiatry Consortium, and today I'm joined by three guests who represent a selection of the consortium partners. Joining me is Dr. John Isaacs from Johnson & Johnson Innovation, Dr. Rob Pinnock from Biogen, and Dr. Peter Maycox from Takeda. John, Rob and Peter are all experts in neuroscience drug discovery and they lead a portfolio of psychiatry projects within their respective organisations. For the Psychiatry Consortium, they sit on our scientific committee and they review applications to our funding calls. Um, together with representatives from our other partner organisations, they decide which projects to pursue and they support us in the development and ultimately the funding and the delivery of these projects. So today is a really great opportunity to learn more about the factors that influence those decisions directly from the partners um, and to further understand what it is that these guys are looking for when they review your applications. So before we talk to our guests, um, some quick reminders. This is a Zoom webinar, which I'm sure most people are quite familiar with now. So we can't see or hear you. Um, but if you do have any technical issues, um, Darren Holmes is here to support us. Um, and if you need to get in touch with him for any technical issues, if you can't hear us or you can't see us at any point, please do pop him a message in the chat or his email is on the screen as well. Um, and this is a, an opportunity for a really interactive discussion with our partners. So if you have any questions that you want to submit um, that come up during our conversation, then please do submit any questions at any point using the Q&A function, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. Um, just before we start, so that we can understand a little bit more about who we have on the call today, um, I'd like to launch a quick poll. Darren, could you please um, let that go live just to see how much you know about the scope of our funding call already. Have you engaged with us before? Um, or do you feel like you already um, know about what we're, what we're doing? Or is this the first time that you're engaging with the consortium? Um, so if you could just pop your answer in there. Give that a moment for everyone to fill it in. And when you're ready, Darren, if you just let us know the results. Currently, we're looking at 14% nothing at all, 64% a little, 18% enough to apply, and 5% everything there is to know. So, wait Great. A little. Great. Thank you, everyone, for doing that. So the 5% that said everything there is to know, um, please come and help me and <laughs> work with me on this. Um, your expertise will be much appreciated. Um, there is so much information on our website for people who said that they know um, not very much about this call. We've done some webinars in the past which um, really explain in detail the review process, the application process, um, all of the details of what we're looking for in a project. So I would advise that you go onto our website and look under the resources tab um, the latest webinar is, I think it's titled Psychiatry Consortium Third Call for Proposals, and that runs through the scope um, for this call in quite some detail. Um, there's also the Frequently Asked Questions section on the website and a couple of papers on there as well that our partners have highlighted as places um, and pieces of research that are of interest um, for us too. So, so there's loads of resources and information there. So if you don't know anything at all, um, then I would go and check out those items. Um, so as a very brief overview um, to catch everyone up to speed, we are really looking for um, projects which are surrounding the, the target validation of novel targets for psychiatric conditions. Again, a full list of conditions that we're, we're looking for are available on our website. Um, but in a nutshell, we're looking to fund projects to focus on the validation of novel molecular targets for mental health conditions. And at this stage, um, in the application part, we're just looking for a high level overview of your proposed target and your project. And if that project is of interest to multiple partners, we then work with applicants to bring together all of the expertise of the psychiatry consortium, our CRO partners, um, our pharma partners, our charity partners, and we really work with you to develop a robust project plan. So 
Um, even though it's only a couple of weeks away to the deadline, at the moment, we're just looking for that really high level overview. So there is still time for you to submit. And we then work with you to create that full package of evidence that's needed to fully validate a target, to take it through to enter into the drug discovery process. Um, and though the application stage is very high level, it's crucial to get across the essence of the project the therapeutic rationale behind um, what you're looking to explore and how you propose to build on any existing research if there is any existing research to build upon. So it's probably a good point to stop here and, and refer to our panelists and, and to see exactly for you guys what makes a good um, proposal. So I'll, I'll start um, with each of you in turn. Um, I'll start with Rob because you're on my top left. Um, in your opinion, what makes a good application, a strong application for you? So if there's something, um, so is the biology strong? Um, and when I say is the biology strong, we know that psychiatric disease is extraordinarily complex. Um, it's not that there may be genetic links, but there is also, there are also other um, pieces of evidence um, and anything from the sort of human um, perspective from the clinic that actually makes us think about what, how that, how that links back to the proposal is always very helpful for us in, to, to decide whether if there's, and it goes through the whole business of if, if there's a target there, can we make drugs to it? But it's actually whether it's actually going to translate to some benefit in humans at the end of the, of the whole process. And we, you know, there's some very cool science that can be done on the way, but if it doesn't translate, then it's very, um, it's very disappointing. But also, it it means that um, we haven't used the the, the resources actually as, as best we can. So to me, it's always looking for something which links it into the human condition at the end of the uh, of the process. Thanks, Rob. Same question to you, John. Yeah, um, so so I think I think I mean, Robert already captured some of the key key things, and it's it's, it's notable that, that I think most of the, the pharma partners on the psychiatric sort of think in a similar way, and I think that is because you know we're big pharma, we're focused on drug discovery, so that's what we want to get. That's what we want to get to. Um, so so for me, one of the key plus points then of a, of a good application is is there some obvious path to drug discovery. That's, that's going to be important. It doesn't have to be a drug discovery pro project, but we want to see that the, the work's going to lead to maybe the next step would be how to then start a drug discovery project. Because um, one of the key questions that, that we all have is we've got to make some sort of medicine at some point. So we have to determine whether it's possible to make a molecule, you know, be it a small molecule or, or an antibody or, or some other type of molecule that, that um, therapeutically interacts with the target that can be given to patients ultimately. So I guess that's one thing. Um, Rob's already, you know, talked about connection to human disease, absolutely critical. There's got to be a very strong connection to human disease. Um, it's got to be novel. I'm going to talk about novel, novelty in a moment, I think, actually. So I won't go, go into that anymore. It's got to be feasible. Um, so, so that's important. It's got to be, you know, it's a practical aspect to this. It's got to be a feasible thing to do. And I suppose the last thing which we think about is, is tox, toxicity risk. So if, if your target is a great, you know, great set of biology, it's involved in a process really interesting in the brain, but that target already has an extremely well-established risk of toxicity in the periphery, then that is going to be a major hurdle because, you know, all drugs will also hit the periphery unless they're centrally administered. So I think those, for me, are the main, the main features we look for. Peter. I'm going to unmute Peter, sorry. So I, I would agree with all of those comments. I think just to reinforce the, the link to human disease and to illustrate it with the kind of thing I've, I've seen in some proposals in the past, which is they will point to say synaptic physiology as being fundamental to a disorder like say schizophrenia, which it looks like it is, and then pick a gene that modulates synaptic physiology, but the gene itself has got no link into the disease. Um, and that, that, you know, from painful experience in the past hasn't really worked as a drug discovery strategy. Those kinds of things usually fall apart frequently later than you'd like. 
Um, so I think having the link to the disorder, uh, either direct, and it can also be that um, it doesn't have to come directly from genetics or genomics, but it can be a pathway that looks like it's robustly associated with the disease and a target which is a known strong modulator of that pathway or able to influence what's going on. So those kinds of proposals, I think, is what we're looking for. And, and as, as John said, tox liability, like again, if you go into the field of you know, schizophrenia with the calcium uh, channels, they come up a lot in genetic uh, analyses, but there's a tremendous herb liability with some of them. And there are efforts to try and distinguish transcriptomic variants, which could be relatively selective targets, but um, it's that kind of thing. And I think the other thing to add to it is that every, every opportunity is unique. So each one, there will be things which ha are strong or, or weaker. But again, you're always looking for that thread all the way through to what will be ultimately, we hope, some sort of clinical benefit. So actually, it is quite useful to talk to, to psychiatrists um, uh, to, to understand if, you know, what, what a particular problem is at the end of the day. But again, it's building beforehand um, so, you know, there may not be, there may be a, a, a strong genetic link, but always remember, for example, schizophrenia, it's a polygenic disease, you know, the, we don't want to end up treating 0.1% of the people who are suffering from schizophrenia, we'd like to be able to do more than that. Um, mm. So it's, it's, is there something else which brings the, that target to, a, to be particularly relevant for in some way that connects to a biological pathway that we think is disrupted in a psychiatric disorder. Thanks. I think we've touched, I think everyone's actually touched on the point that um, we place a very strong focus on that link between the target and the proposed disease. And um, that is something that is a specific question on the application form um, where we ask for what evidence there is to, to link the, um, your proposed target to the indication that you've, you've chosen. Um, and I suppose Peter's touched on that, that that could be a genetic link. It could be the fact that there's uh, this information has come out of genetic studies. Um, I wonder whether you could comment on, any of you comment on the, um, the kind of projects that you would, the kind of applications that you would like to see and the kind of experiments that have been done, the kind of evidence that there is out there to support that link to disease is um, in addition to potentially the fact that this um, this gene or this um, that may have come through a genetic linkage study. Are there any other types of studies that people could um, include to, to provide that support that links it to the human condition specifically? I, mean, I think um, one of the other areas that related to this is, is, a, is a target that modulates a, a circuit or, or functional uh, aspect of, of human brain physiology that's of interest and but again it's got to come from human data so so that was quite hard to find but there are examples for example example the orexin system was essentially largely characterized uh, as being important in arousal due to narcolepsy and um, patients who lost all their orexinergic neurons due to an autoimmune reaction and that that gave extremely strong evidence that the orexin system drove arousal um, so you can think about other pathways. The dopamine pathway obviously has been well established as a reward pathway and, and reward circuitry is, is altered in, in certain psychiatric conditions. So mood disorders, for example. Um, so thinking about novel ways to modulate a reward circuitry that, that go outside of established clinical molecules because that obviously is a, an area that's been targeted quite a lot. Or are there other pathways one can think about? But I would like to stress that, that certainly I think we're probably all in agreement, us, us three on the call here, is that the animal model data to establish targets for psychiatric conditions are generally not useful um, because of the complications of translating animal behavioral models into human um, clinical efficacy. And, and, you know, I think, as Peter said, through bitter experience, many of us have experienced programs in the past, many programs in the past, where um, targets were selected based on animal behavioral data and have not translated into any efficacy in the clinic, which is why the, the, the push has been around human disease association, very specifically human disease association through genetics, or as I mentioned, targets modulate circuit function. 
and, and just to go to the sort of the target itself question is, um, and it depends on the question that is, is being asked, but how and how easy is, is it to design um, some sort of specific um, agent for it? So if there are a lot of, um, so, so making, uh, say, phosphatase drug inhibitors, it's, it's actually pretty challenging because they're very similar. But it's, is there some feature in whatever the target is that means it should be possible to separate out the most relevant form or forms in order to pursue just those with um, a pharmaceutical intervention of some sort. So again, it, every case is unique when you look at a particular project um, proposal, but it's, can you see a route through to making around that target where the biology is really well understood by the investigators and they can see a route through, to, and, and that's why they're, why investigators will be proposing a particular target because they think it's a potential route in. So we, it's good to see that sort of data to, to show a strong understanding of it. Thank you. Um, Peter, did you have any thoughts on that particular topic? I, I would only say, and we, it's quite rare to see it um, for understandable reasons, but data derived from patient samples, um, potentially the best Possibility there is IPS derived neurons or neural tissues, uh, where there's been some attempt to look at the function or the modulation of the potential candidate gene in those systems. I think they would give a high degree of you know initial confidence or some some degree of initial confidence. And to pick up on John's point about animal models, I think when they're considered as models, is absolutely correct. It, it, I think it's okay to use animal animal for mechanistic modeling. So where you're looking into a specific process, whether it's, I don't know, synaptic strength or something like that, I, I think to some degree you can use the model specifically to that without extrapolating that to the broader illness that you're looking at. Thanks, that's a, that's a really good point. And um, something that the Psychiatry Consortium is actually addressing in a workshop later this month around the validity of the, and the translatability of um, preclinical models in psychiatric drug discovery. Um, so no, maybe- see, yeah. I'll just say, Laura, you know, what, what I think the key here is, is you start with a target that's selected based on belief that's involved in a human disease yes. due to human evidence. Then you take back into the animal model and say, how can we model um, uh, 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 therapeutically influencing this target such that the animal can then tell you, measures done in the preclinical model can tell you that your therapeutic molecule is doing what you expect it to do. Um, and then, then can inform you when you go back into the clinic to test that therapy you can model what biomarkers and pharmacodynamic responses you want to see. So that's, I think, the way we see it. Extremely useful, very important. But starting from animal model and giving an animal a drug and saying it swims more or less in a full swim test, therefore the target of that drug is it's got to be something involved in depression in humans is not something that I think most pharma companies now would, would, would follow. And just to build on that point that John's made about biomarkers, if there is something which is a, um, a surrogate for engagement of the target in uh, a whole animal or um, in the human, that's actually very helpful information to have. Because again, that informs us the, the whole way through the discovery process of, you know, we've, if you, if, can you make something? If you can, is it there in the right concentration? And is it actually doing what we expect it to do on that surrogate? And again, it's a lot to ask because this is early stage research, but just that sort of thinking process through it. What would you expect to be seeing is, is the question. Thanks, and I think the um, something that John picked up on before, um, and I guess something that's quite linked to the, the amount of evidence to support um, a novel target is just how novel is that target. And if it is, um, very novel and, and we don't know very much about it then there's we appreciate that there is going to be less evidence there to support that link um, but if that evidence is strong then that is um, definitely a type of application that we would welcome. Um, I wonder whether you could comment on the that definition of novelty and, and, and what we mean and because I think that is um, 
something that applicants tend to to query a lot is is my target novel enough for the psychiatry consortium um so i wonder whether you could you could speak to that kind of those thought processes that you have when you're looking at a target and, and what makes you think yes this is a novel target or no actually that's too late or too early even I, mean, I, I think um, there's three parts to novelty one, one is there's a brand new discovery in an academic lab that's maybe never even been published before maybe a new genetic association of, of target x with psychiatric indication y so there you've got, obviously got novelty straight off the bat. Nobody's ever worked on this target before. Second class of novelty, I think, is a novel angle on a, an, an existing target. So maybe a subtype of a, of a receptor that you're going after that, with evidence that this particular subtype is particularly involved in a psychiatric disease and, and that you've got a strategy to target that subtype that nobody else has ever done before. Um, and the third part, third, third piece of this is, is um, is, is a, a, a target that's been looked at before, but, but has so far failed to get into the clinic. Um, and that third one, we, you know, one does see thing, things like that quite a lot. And the really key question there is, what are you doing differently from what's been done in the past? Why are you gonna be successful when others, and, and it'll often, there will often be large pharma efforts, you know, putting many millions of dollars uh, at, at these targets have failed. And, and often we have proprietary knowledge about some of these targets, you know, we've, our internal, people have worked on them before. So quite often what will happen is, you know, we'll see a target, I'll go back to our internal people and they say, yeah, we tried that five years ago. It didn't work for these four reasons. And then, then the question is, what, you know, what is the applicant doing that's really gonna do that? I think this is a bit of a challenge for applicants because some of those data are not publicly available, what Big Pharma have been done, but I would encourage applicants when they have their targets, look at the literature, look at patents, uh, look at conference abstracts to see if, if work's been done on the target. Biotechs often have working on targets of interest and will have things in there that, that can be searched, you know, and found. That's a really important thing, I think. Yeah, and again, I guess anything that if you do a search through clinical trials um, and have a look, you know, the public web website, anything which has been sitting in phase one for a very large number of years um, and started its phase one studies um, years ago is probably there's probably it's probably failed when it's gone into phase two because the phase two data isn't usually uh, I know efforts are being made to publish it and sometimes you do see data but it's probably not been published so stuff is there um, there are in there are pointers to mechanisms which have been tested and failed um, although we don't actually have the data out there in the public domain. And, you know, rival farmers don't, you know, we don't see other pharma companies phase two data. I would also say you, you get targets like GSK3 beta, which come up a lot in psychiatry, but it, again, it's been around for such a long time and been patented in the chemical space so frequently. I think the general view is on a target like that. There's just nowhere to go in terms of developing further chemistry that's yeah. unique and patentable. Um, it doesn't mean the target isn't any good. It just means that for commercial development, um, it would be very challenging. And, and perhaps the question there would be, if the investigator is aware of that, that the target's been around for a while and it's been investigated, is there something that they've got which is different is there some different approach that they've taken which enables them to do what nobody else has been able to do? Um, because, you know, that, that actually, that's novel. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, yeah. And I think that is defined in our um, terms and conditions that novelty is um, either a novel target or a novel way of modulating or approaching the modulation of a, a target that may be considered not quite so novel. Um, so I suppose that there's, there's multiple ways to look at that. Um, I wonder whether we can leap back as well to this question that was raised earlier around um, the translatability of these targets and the clinical relevance, because that's something that you all touched on um, in our first question. And it's something that one of our delegates actually raised um, and submitted a question of um, whether applicants need to demonstrate clinical 
applicability in their proposal um, and whether it's useful to involve clinical colleagues in those discussions. And I've just noticed in the chat that um, Gareth Cuttle, hi Gareth, um, from the Royal College of Psychiatrists has um, put a note there to say that if that is something that um, you want a psychiatrist to collaborate with you on um, a proposal and, and you want to have those discussions, then he's put his contact details there to facilitate that exchange. Um, and I think the Psychiatry Consortium as a whole, um, in both our funding of projects and the wider activities that we do is very much for patient benefit and to address unmet clinical patient needs. So the more you can demonstrate that you've you've thought that through and that the um, the target that you're looking to, to pursue or the, the project that you want to, to learn more about and develop is ultimately going to have clinical significance and whether that's in a small group of patients or a large group of patients, that's something that um, we specifically address within the application form. Um, and, and we welcome applications from multidisciplinary teams and collaborative applications as well. So um, there's definitely an opportunity to, outside of the psychiatry consortium as well, I think just for good translational research, it's, it's good to keep that point of view to the clinic. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. Yeah, I think this is, yeah. this is critical. Um, you know, I think, you know, I, I suppose internally pharma companies think about this quite a lot because we think about patient need. That's a, a big driver of, of areas we select. Um, but equally, patient need and, you know, it, it's patients, it's carers. And, you know, there's a number of aspects to this which need to be constantly thought about and updated um, as well. Yes, oh, totally. It's, and it's, you know, have, have a conversation with somebody who's actually in contact with patients because it gives an additional understanding um, of, of what would really help uh, the patient. And um, I suppose talking about um, the kind of the more patient end of things, we've got another question that kind of links into that um, around the, what indications um, specifically are, is psychiatry, drug discovery, um, Pharma looking to for, for the future of drug discovery in psychiatry? Are there any specific indications that you think have promise? Um, a disclaimer, the Psychiatry Consortium covers a broad range of um, psychiatric conditions and there is no preference. Um, if it's in scope and it's a good project, then we don't look at things in terms of that. But is there, to answer this um, delegate specific question, is there any particular indications where you see particular promise? I mean, I, mean, I, can, I can answer, I, th I think, one thing to think about is, is indication, psychiatric indications are, I think, a challenging thing to think about because they're probably not biological diseases, individual diseases. So we, we tend to think about um, uh, treating uh, particular syndromes that underlie a number of indications. So, so for example, Jane Jay is very interested in mood disorders that, that are associated obviously with major depressive disorder, but also they're associated with a number of other cl clinical indications, um, bipolar disorder, PTSD, there's a significant mood disorder component with schizophrenia, with uh, dementia, for example. So, so we want to boil this down to um, dis syndromes or disorders that have a, a biological underpinning. And, then, and that then gives us a path into drug, drug discovery to target the biology that's driving the, the syndrome or, or symptom. Um, so, so I think, you know, I think mood disorders, it's a huge unmet need there. I think psychosis is, a, is still a very large unmet need there as well. Um, the, probably the most challenging one is cognitive impairment, which is associated with a number of disorders, for example, schizophrenia. I think that's a very challenging area at the moment to understand the biology to treat. But again, if somebody had a brainwave had a, to target that, that would be extremely interesting as well. Yeah. And um, negative symptoms in schizophrenia as well. Um, mm -hmm. and, and just to, th to go back to um, the the cognitive side of things. So that's so again when we look at a project, um, as a pharma company, we know that we're going to have to actually go all the way through with one particular indication. But at the end of it, we would also consider indication expansion. So just because we say we're going for cognitive impairment and schizophrenia, doesn't mean that we wouldn't think as we went up that development process that we would also be thinking about indication expansion eventually into other cognitive disorders where it may be relevant. So, you know, it's, it's not a sort of a direct siloed approach um, 
necessarily i mean there are things that we have to do for efficiency reasons and, and in order to generate a product but um we try and think broadly about these as well um and i think we've got a question that um kind of i think so far we've we've focused a lot on the the validation of these known targets that we um maybe know a little about and, and can go on to further develop what about identifying those targets in the first place um, I wonder whether the target identification within certain parameters is um, within remit of the consortium. Um, at what stage would you consider a target identification program? Um, so, for example, um, we've got a question here around um, statistical genetics work involved in target discovery. Is that of interest? Um, and and what's the kind of the thoughts processes around? identification of targets versus development of targets so, so i think i think so at least to my mind and the, you know others may disagree I, I think we'd want to have some initial evidence that the targets associate the disease um, rather than starting from scratch um, because this is a psychiatric consortium after all so so we are trying to target targets that are involved in psych psychiatric conditions so i think there needs to be some existing evidence that the target is associated with with the human disease of interest but i think then but if, if that, that's already there then the next step for me then is developing a therapeutic hypothesis based on that target do we need to increase or decrease its function quite simple but again for things like a gwos um, associated um, target that's that can be quite difficult um, and i think that would potentially fall in scope yeah, as long as there was a a clear path to drug discovery of that, i.e. that it's likely to be a druggable target. I think the problem we sometimes face with some applications is you get, you get multiple challenges piling up, you know, so it's a target that's not very well associated with human disease that needs to be validated. It's a protein-protein interaction that needs to be blocked by a, you know, which we know are very hard to challenge, you know, hard to, to affect. You, know, you probably have to use a peptide and peptides are not really drugs usually, they can't get in the brain, they're not stable. So you don't want to build up multiple levels of, of challenge. We don't mind one, one or two challenges, but it, that, that comes down to this sort of feasibility package overall, I think. So again, just and clarify the question again, Laura, because statistical genetics, I mean, potentially you, you, would it be, would it be to build the case around a particular target um, to sort of, using the the statistical genetics approach and then request that um sort of tool compounds or something could be synthesized because I, I, i'm not quite sure what that would be or would it be to 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 do statistical genetics per se um the question I'm, isn't particularly clear i wonder whether if the person that posed that question I, I don't know who it was um is on the conversation then maybe put some clarity in um and develop your question in the q a and then we can we can circle back yeah to it because um, it's an interesting point that we can we can discuss further with a little bit more information um, so as a more kind of stepping away from the the call and the focus of what we do as a broader um, question this consortium has been developed and initiated specifically because what we're trying to do is very difficult and, and as John was just saying these challenges are stacking up um, when you are trying to do this work and and that can be very difficult for um, academic groups or research institutions or small companies um, to take on alone. And Big Pharma, to an extent, have stepped away slightly um, from psychiatric drug, discover, drug discovery, sorry, um, historically, um, because of those challenges. And obviously the companies that are within the consortium are clearly committed to psychiatric drug discovery, otherwise they wouldn't be, be supporting us. Um, I wonder whether you have any comments of, um, of what, you, what you would say to people who do say that psychiatry is just too difficult to do these, um, this work and it's uh, big pharma are leaving, um, it's, it's just target validation within psychiatry is just too difficult. What are your opinions on that? <laughs> do, you, do you agree? <laughs> um, so, so everything is difficult. I mean, there's this, and and that's not meant as a sort of glib comment. It, developing drugs is extraordinarily hard work. 
Um, so the re one of the reasons the pharma companies pulled away from psychiatry originally was not because the, there wasn't a recognition of the need. The need the, we know there's a need. It was that the science wasn't developed enough for us ena to enable us to think about how we could start a discovery program. And the science that is occurring now is, um, and that's the whole purpose of the psychiatry consortium, is that the pieces are coming together, which enable us to start figuring out how do we actually develop a program using the science that's coming through now to actually get a product which is going to help people um, in terms of, you know, bring a therapeutic benefit because, and, and that's um, probably haven't answered the question very clearly, um, but it is definitely worth um, doing psychiatry um, and trying to develop drugs because yeah, this, I think the science is coming together and we, we joined this so that we could look at as a group of pharma companies, essentially pre-competitive information um, to, to help um, bring some of those projects forward. I, I mean, the, main, the, 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 the challenge here, you know, is that, that it costs about a billion dollars to take, take one idea right through to uh, clinical development to test if it's actually gonna work in a patient. And one in 10 programs tends to work, i.e. of results in a, a launch drug that's successful so we're basically talking about $10 billion. So, so we need to really have really good ideas to start with when you're focusing on that. And that I think what happened in pharma a number of years ago is oncology became the science developed so well, again, through huge amounts of academic research, public private partnerships, et cetera, um, that suddenly the, the science became really tractable. And so a lot of companies spent a lot more effort on oncology and oncology being a huge success story. And we hope psychiatry will be the next huge success story in discovering new targets due to an increased understanding. But you think about cancer used to be thought as one or two diseases and they were called cancer. But now there are hundreds of different cancers and they're actually very different diseases and they're understood and there are very specific therapies targeting individual cancers. Um, I think we're at the same problem with psychiatry. You know, we, we call say depression, depression, but it's likely probably a number of of biological processes, a number of biologically defined sub-diseases that, that result in a, a mood disorder. I think you'd probably say the same probably for um, schizophrenia and, and other, you know, other major psychiatric indications. So, so, so we need to really get to that point where we understand what, what are the biological mechanisms and start. And, and that's really where this consortium is really helping you know, with the best brains from academia, with pharma companies coming together, sharing the risk, working together with the best academics and the best CROs to come up with really persuasive new targets and, and early you know, drug discovery tools and assays and validation, then I think, then hopefully that will then set off some real, really, you know, really well thought out drug discovery programs that have a good, good chance of being successful. I think, yeah, just to be specific about the point John just, just touched on with the analogy to, to cancer, where you basically had a highly, eventually highly stratified area of, of multiple different diseases, um, which hasn't really happened yet in the kind of major categories, if you go back to schizophrenia. Um, and so anything which eventually stratifies patient populations, and this is gonna require a huge effort in the kind of academic clinical world to, to get that depth of information that's required to generate those kinds of information um, allows a kind of an approach to a target within a more selected proper, um, population, which offsets the risk, which big pharma take a look at this. And for the, exactly that reason that John highlighted, this one in 10 expense, uh, huge expense of progression is then somewhat mitigated by the fact that you have a more discrete patient population. And many of the previous clinical trials fail just for that reason that you're dealing with a very heterogeneous patient population uh, in which the mechanism that you're approaching um, is, is not actually the cause or playing a role. So that, that will change. Of course, right now that doesn't help in terms of, um, you know, is it worth going into psychiatry was the question. Uh, I think, yeah, I think there is, there is enough information and there are ways of thinking about coming forward from the human position, from the human data. And so, starting points which emerge from analysis of human data, human samples will give a strong uh, 
a, a strong introduction into the into the uh, consortium. And I think um, just kind of building on those points, what um, what do you see then as the I'll ask this one to each of you as well. Um, what what do you see as the benefit of approaching this type of research, this very early stage, very high risk? Um, type of research within psychiatry specifically through the model that we have as the consortium rather than academics working alone or, or pharma working alone or, or maybe even just a collaboration between one academic and one company what's the specific benefit maybe well, maybe if you could answer both from your perspective and also for the academics perspective as well what's the benefit of going through the consortium i i think from our perspective it's it's a shared risk of of um has been even at the front end of early target identification and progression. It shares that risk of what to work on. Um, we share expertise and thinking around how we would approach these individual targets. And I think we, I certainly learned a lot from the way other pharma partners think about how to progress. I think from an academic's perspective, they get this insight of how pharma thinks and the, the issues which confront pharma, which I think are not always obvious. Yes, so, and there's a whole lot of questions and answers that, um, so it's a, it's a to, to us it's a great idea to engage with um, academics, but not necessarily, if we were to engage on a one-to-one -one basis, then it tends to become, uh, again, it's a limited conversation. If uh, some, if an academic comes to the consortium, there's a discussion across the whole of the group. So you essentially you're getting eight times because I think there are eight partners altogether in the in in the consortium. There are eight points of view coming together um, to discuss a program, which gives you there there are more insights. And although we often think in a similar way about things, there are differences, and those can be very significant. Um, and I think what also I'm always on the lookout for is to be potentially surprised by things that we thought we knew, but we didn't really understand to know. And just to go back to John's comment about the oncology. So, and I was fortunate enough to be doing this in a previous life for, for um, a company. There was a period when for oncology, it was, um, well, the immune systems really, uh, I mean, it's important, but it's not going to be the, the the potential future cure. But once it became apparent that you could intervene with immunological therapeutics, and that was in a stratified population, you could then open that up. And it suddenly became apparent that the immune system was actually much more important. So there could be things like that that we we because we're thinking within single organizations that we miss and you know to be part of the psychiatry consortium allows us to see a greater breadth of of opportunities um so and i think you wanted to know how would it but how does it benefit um how do we think it benefits the academics well i hope it there's if a project is successfully funded, then great, yes, you, you have more than one partner who's working with you so you can get a broad perspective. And if it's not funded, then there's feedback as to why. Thanks. Yeah, and same question to you, John. Yeah, no, I, I think as you all captured that really well in terms of the breadth of the of science and, and you know innovative ideas coming, coming into the psychiatry consortium that, that we in our organizations have not thought about because you do have this sort of group think problem in these large organizations. Um, so, so I think that's great. I, I also really like, I like the ability to work um, not only with the pharma partners, also the CRO partner yeah. um, to think about the drug discovery at this early point. And, and actually that interaction is really interesting because I, I think it also feeds back with, into the academic um, proposer as well, you know, who's often the science expert, but maybe not thought about the drug discovery. And you have this really beautiful creative sort of um, moment sometimes where it all suddenly you get, it becomes much bigger than, than just um, the original idea. And I think that's a really creative, interesting process that we all learn from. And, and, I hope, and I hope that's the academic partner learns from that as well. I think if an academic partner is really interested in translating their ideas um, it, you know, towards drug discovery, then this is a great forum to learn from at the very least. Um, but, but hopefully also would be a forum 
a, a way to actually get the work done and, and potentially then there'd be another a follow-on collaboration afterwards as well so hopefully it, it is, is valuable to the academic partner. Yeah, I think so. And I think um, I'm glad you mentioned the CROs because we've, we've got a question um, about the kind of capabilities that we can support with. And I think it's really important to flag that our CRO partners, um, Charles River and EvaTech, are assigned to you. Either one is assigned to an application and um, for applications that partners are interested in, um, one of those CROs will support the development of it. And that is a really iterative and collaborative process between the academics and the CRO and the partners that are interested, where we literally do get in a room and, well, we used to get in a room, now it might be over Zoom, um, and we discuss the project as a whole and everything that we could do with it and all of the different capabilities that we can bring all of that knowledge together. Um, so the, the specific question was, can you support with medicinal chemistry? Yes, absolutely, that's something we can do. Our partners um, have such a vast range of um, capabilities from assay development to um, high throughput screening, tool compound development. We, we cover pretty much every aspect of the, the drug development pathway and we can support with physically doing those things if you don't have the, the capability um, in-house to conduct those experiments yourself, but also those conversations, I think, at the application stage, whether a project is funded or not, are equally valuable and really, um, really <coughs> Sorry, excuse my dog. Um, <laughs> I thought I'd been careful at unmuting and muting, but just, just got in. Um, so just before we wrap up, um, just to say to um, people on the, on the line as well. If you have any specific questions that um, we haven't covered, do pop them in, in the Q&A section um, and we can address those in the last couple of minutes. Um, I, I suppose one last question um, from me to address really then is we've, we've touched on all of these different um, aspects that are really important coming back to the application and this current funding call. Um, in a couple of, just a sentence, a couple of sentences, um, what for each of you is the most your most important um, priority when you're looking at projects to to whether they're going to go through or not? What's the most important thing that you that you look for? And just to go back to the comment at the beginning that people were making on the panel about plausibility and uh, link to human pathophysiology, I, I'm not so worried about directionality of intervention. At, the, at this point, I think that can be worked out. I mean, obviously we need to know that for the CROs eventually, but yeah. Yeah, likewise, it's it's that, uh, yeah, the, the sort of sense check, does this make sense to me? And also, again, I'm prepared to be surprised and it's a good, it's good actually when that happens and you said, huh, I never thought of that, but that actually all makes sense. That's a really good good route to get to a therapeutic. I think link, link to human disease is, is the number one thing. Um, and I wouldn't worry too much about what psychiatric indication it's necessarily linked to, um, because I think, again, we think about, think about the underlying um, syndrome or, or you know, symptom rather than whether it's called schizophrenia or called depression, you know, but there's not going to be some human disease biology there. Okay, thank you. Uh, just, uh, that's a really important point because yeah. It might also be, it might be better to think about intellectual disability or negative symptomatology and not worry about whether you're calling it depression or bipolar. Oscar. Great. Um, so I think we've not got any further questions in the Q&A that have just jumped up. So um, on that note, I think we'll bring this webinar to a close. Um, hopefully it's been useful for everyone listening in and to hear directly from our partners. If you do want any more information or you've not um, had your question answered or you want to have further discussions, um, visit our website. There's all of those resources that I mentioned earlier on. Um, you can view previous webinars where we talk about these specific stages of the application and the review process that we've mentioned today. Um, and you can also contact me directly um, and I'd be happy to have any one-to-one -one conversations with potential applicants if you want to discuss your idea and your, um, your proposal before submitting. Um, the deadline is the 8th of March. This is a hard deadline and that's another common question. Um, there will be future calls, however, so we will um, open this up again, um, most likely in summer and again in winter, um, and there'll be further calls next year as well. 
Um, it's just a couple of weeks to the deadline, but rest assured it is quite a short application form because at this point we are just looking for that high level information. So there is still plenty of time to apply. Um, we don't need any research costings or research finance to be involved at this stage either. So that can um, speed things up somewhat. Um, so yeah, I would love to thank our panelists today. Thank you, Rob, John and Peter. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing those insights and thoughts with us today. Um, and to our audience, thank you for your questions. Thank you for submitting them um, in advance and, and on the call today. Um, and I look forward to receiving your application soon. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.